So as mentioned, today's session is looking at uh, adaptation communications, national adaptation plans, and NDCs. To start, I'm going to give a brief presentation on trends in adaptation requests to the NDC partnership, which will be followed by a presentation by Rebecca Carter from World Resources Institute. And then we will have a discussion with colleagues from IISD and the Netherlands. And we're very pleased to have them with us today. Uh, to give an introduction, the NDC partnership is a global coalition bringing together more than 200 members, including over 120 countries both developed and developing, and more than 80 institutions to deliver on ambitious climate action that helps achieve the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. To give some background in how we work, governments identify their NDC implementation priorities and the type of support needed to translate them into actionable policies and programs. Based on these requests, our membership offers a tailored package of expertise, technical assistance, and funding. The collaborative process provides developing countries with efficient access to a wide range of resources to adapt to and mitigate climate change and foster more equitable, sustainable development. Essentially, the partnership is built on the premise of collective action. By acting together, we can achieve more. And through the NDC partnership, countries draw on members' expertise and funding, turning NDCs into actionable policies, programs, and projects. The partnership's approach powers a collective response in which the whole is greater than its parts. As part of our work in 2019, responding to countries' specific needs to update and enhance their NDCs, we launched dedicated support um, called the Climate Action Enhancement Package. And through CAP, 67 partners mobilized more than 55 million US dollars to support 67 countries in the, uh, around the globe in enhancing and fast tracking the implementation of their NDCs. There was a report published on the global trends and lessons learned through the Climate Action Enhancement Package. I encourage you to visit our website and read the report. You can visit the site by scanning the QR code with your phone, or you can visit enhancement.ndcpartnership.org. And there was a really interesting and, and fantastic set of outcomes where countries submitted their new NDCs, updated NDCs to UNFCCC. Um, and the NDCs were much more robust than the first generation of NDCs on both mitigation and adaptation issues. And then based on stronger underlying data, the new NDCs were more detailed and achievable as well as verifiable. And the processes by which countries developed those NDCs were more inclusive and transparent, incorporating more segments of government and society. Uh, beyond this, countries have developed NDC implementation plans and have begun working on aligning NDCs with national development plans, including national adaptation plans and NDCs being aligned, uh, as well as domestic, other domestic strategies. Our members are developing investment plans, financing strategies, and project pipelines, but more capacity support is needed. I'm going to take a moment to look specifically at some of the long-term adaptation trends that we saw in NDCs, which were supported through CAP. We conducted analysis based on 55 of the 67 countries who had submitted their NDCs by December 2021. What we found was that 45 countries enhanced the adaptation components by developing national adaptation plans or other national adaptation strategies, setting out measures to strengthen adaptation capabilities and resilience across key vulnerable sectors. In a detailed review of countries' vulnerability and development of priorita prioritization tools, um, these fed into more comprehensive adaptation strategies. So we also saw that 45 of these 55 countries increased sectoral scope of adaptation targets with health, water, and agriculture being the most enhanced sectors. Um, CAP supported uh, 23 of these 45 countries, focusing on 
gathering information required to increase the scope, as well as ensuring the increase in scope was matched by an expansion of MRV system. CAP support targeting adaptation targets was mostly focused on developing studies and analysis to support well-informed and robust targets, MRV strengthening support, and stakeholder engagement. Something I think is really interesting and a useful component of increasing feasibility of implementation, 24 countries updated information on barriers to achieving adaptation targets in their NDCs. Understanding these barriers enables the development of effective long-term adaptation strategies that can be effectively implemented. So in looking beyond CAP and at the partnership as a whole, we can take a look at all of the requests that we have received. The partnership in our knowledge management system currently has about 5,600 requests for support in our knowledge management database as of this week. Of these 1,300, or just about a quarter of them, are related to adaptation. The other categories are mitigation and then cross-cutting requests. Uh, 64 countries have requested adaptation support uh, and given the increasing impact of climate change in countries globally and the increased inclusion in NDCs of adaptation, we anticipate further requests to come in. For adaptation requests, the type of support that we see is predominantly for technical assistance at 62% of requests. While the remaining 38% of requests relate to projects. In looking at the trends from a sectoral lens, the sectors of agriculture, water, and forestry, and other land use or FOLU are the top three requests by sector, which also follows the trends that we saw in CAP and what areas were enhanced under CAP. And that was a note that this is, if we exclude those requests where the sector is cross-cutting, and so the requests may not have a sector defined, and those make up almost 600 requests related to adaptation. Uh, I wanted to include this graph here because it shows the breakdown of requests by sector across the different regions in the NDC partnership. And while there's definitely similar trends, I think the differences region by region are interesting in terms of seeing what countries' priorities are in that region. So for example, in the region of South Asia, water followed by agriculture are the top adaptation sectors for NDC support. And in Europe and Central Asia, we see higher requests than average for tourism and fisheries. On the other hand, in the Middle East, we see the most requests related to waste. When we dive into some of the key topics requested under adaptation, the top three are finance and investment, disaster risk reduction, and oceans and coasts. Finance and investment has about 400, almost 500 requests and disaster risk reduction about 350. Almost 90% of disaster risk reduction related requests fall under adaptation. For ocean and coasts, we have about 160 requests and 61% of oceans related requests are related to adaptation. Um, these generally, for, for example, with finance and investment, we see these types of requests being quite common um, in adaptation, mitigation, and cross-cutting requests, but DRR and OCEANS are definitely more prevalent in adaptation tagged um, requests. So interestingly, over half of adaptation related requests to the partnership remain unsupported compared to 49% of mitigation requests and 32% of cross-cutting requests. And um, this is significant because it, it shows there's a lot of room for growth in terms of the support to countries uh, in adaptation. And we see the activity types requested that have the most unsupported requests are preparing bankable projects at 186, developing capacity at 109, 
development of studies and analysis at 105, developing or updating MRV and MNE systems at 97, and enacting and revising national strategies at 90. These unsupported activity types are in line with the types of activities that remain unsupported for mitigation and cross-cutting requests as well. So interestingly, only 16% of adaptation-related requests submitted by the Climate Action Enhancement Package were unsupported. So we're looking to continue to bolster our offerings through the partnership, which does include our thematic call and long-term low emission development strategies um, and long-term strategies generally. So we're looking at adaptation through that lens as well. Um, but we see certainly room for growth in terms of support for adaptation requests. And I think this aligns strongly with the topic of today's session. How can we align NDC's national adaptation plans and adaptation communication to go from commitments to stronger implementation? And our next presenter, Rebecca Carter, who is the adaptation lead with the Climate Resilience Practice at WRI, will be presenting on this. So I'm pleased to hand over to her to share WRI's analysis on the NDC's national adaptation plans and adaptation communications. Rebecca, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you. Excellent. Thanks so much, Jamie. And very happy to be with you all today to talk about going from commitments and plans to actual implementation and what this all has to do with aligning NDCs, NAPs, and adaptation communications. Uh, next slide. So just to very briefly kind of set the global context in which we're, we're operating in, um, you know, the IPCC has put out many reports as have other organizations. I think we've all seen the science, which tells us that Climate change impacts are already evident around the world, and it is often those with the fewest resources with which to adapt who are being hit the hardest. So there's real equity issues, real climate justice issues at play here. Um, the IPCC's reports identify adaptation interventions that are proving effective in improving resilience. In other words, adaptation has been going on long enough that we are learning what works for whom and under what conditions. But even so, despite that good news, they also find a growing gap for adaptation action. You know, climate change impacts are intensifying so rapidly that the current efforts are just not able to keep up. They remain too small scale, fragmented, incremental, and also just too focused on near term climate impacts to really build the kind of long term systemic resilience that the world needs. Next slide. So what I want to talk about today, I mean, what I just outlined, there is a huge challenge, right? But I want to talk about just a, a small portion of it today. And it's kind of this dichotomy between, in theory, how NDCs and NAPs are supposed to work and a couple of challenges that we see in practice. So in theory, we see that NDCs offer the opportunity to present high level adaptation needs and priorities on the international stage and attract funding support for adaptation activities, right? That's what countries use them for. NAPs, on the other hand, are meant to be, you know, they're national adaptation plans. So they're meant for countries to really identify how they're going to address their medium and long-term priorities for adapting to climate change. In practice, though, we see two related challenges. And the first one is, click. Uh, okay, the first one is indeed poor alignment. I mean, what we find when we kind of seek to understand the stories of how countries develop their NAPs is that oftentimes NDCs and NAPs are developed by different governmental ministries, sometimes on different time scales, and sometimes it happens in relative isolation. And because of that, they may contain different priorities and those who must actually implement them, those who have to change what they do every day, change the way they do business, may not have the authority to do so. So for example, if we have the Ministry of Foreign Affairs putting out the NDC, we have the Ministry of Environment putting out the NAP, and it's sometimes not clear who exactly has the authority to tell, for example, the Ministry of Agriculture that they need to start adapting, start doing things differently. A related challenge is that we see real limitations in monitoring, evaluation, and learning on implementation progress across different ministries, but also from the national level, you know, the commitments, the high-level plans, down to the local level where a lot of implementation needs to happen. Next slide. 
So to talk a little bit about this recent research we've done on adaptation in NDCs, and I should uh, note that this research was funded by BMZ through NDC partnership, and we certainly do appreciate that. So what we did in this analysis was take the adaptation components of 200, well, 251 adaptation components. So that was first round of NDCs combined with second round of NDCs. Total of almost 7,000 actions, individual actions that countries said they were going to take to really try to understand the difference between the first round and the second round. Um, from this, we produced two working papers. You can find them on our website at wri.org. Next slide. So from one of these working papers, the state of, of nationally determined contributions for adaptation. When we looked at all 251 NDCs, one way we looked at them was to take this um, framework that was used in the ADAPT NOW report of the Global Commission on Adaptation, um, which WRI co-managed, you know, to do a deep dive on the sectors, right? So we used the seven sectors that were in ADAPT NOW, and you can see the list there, um, plus a few others that were not included in ADAPT NOW, for example, health, uh, locally led adaptation, and an other category. And I'll talk more about that in just a second. Next slide. So highlights of just the overall key findings. When we looked at the current NDC, NDCs, those are the, the blue part of these bars. The yellow part is the first NDCs. You know, and I think um, our findings here are in line with the ones that Jamie just shared. The countries are indeed becoming more detailed and ambitious with the adaptation components of their NDCs. They are including more detailed coverage of multiple sectors and, and systems for adaptation actions. There is, however, a lot of variation in how specific they are across their priority actions. Um, I think our findings were, were pretty aligned with Jamie's in that we found that uh, the food and nutrient, the systems and sectors that were most often prioritized or had the most specific actions within them were food and nutrition, water, and nature-based solutions. But then there was this other category. And one thing that really stood out to us there is that that was a place where a lot of countries expressed the need for capacity building support. Next slide. Okay, so another thing that we looked at was whether or not countries would be able to implement their NDCs. And to try to get some insights onto this, we used nine different criteria. I won't go through them all today. I'll focus on three of them and their alignment implementation readiness of actions, and monitoring and evaluation. Next slide. So when we look specifically at NAPS, we did, find, we did indeed find that there is greater alignment in the NDCs with NAPS in the second round. So again, that's the blue bar. The yellow bar is the first round. Um, the references to national adaptation plans more than double in the updated NDCs. And it is fair to say that in some countries, NAPS really are a key driver of adaptation along with the NDCs. Um, we also found that references to other types of planning like subnational, sectoral, national, and international policy processes were more numerous in the adaptation NDCs. But I think it's important to point out that alignment issues are not fully resolved despite things heading in the right direction. Um, if you look at that top bar, that's actually only 34 country NDCs, the adaptation components uh, out of 144 that we could say really quite closely aligned with NAPS. So there is still a long ways to go. Next slide. Um, we did find that countries were including more details on the process through which they develop their NAPs, which is helpful for understanding, you know, what kind of institutional arrangements they're using, what coordinating entities look like, and also how stakeholder consultations um, might or might not have aligned with the NAPs. So, you know, we, we certainly consider this a, a move in the right direction as well. Next slide. Another important factor of implementation readiness is what kind of detail is included on the costs of implementing these adaptation actions. Um, we found that 62 of those 144, 148, because this slide was updated after we coded a few more NDCs, um, do describe the finance requirements for adaptation. And, you know, I think it's fair to say that the articulation of the costs for adaptation actions is growing, but it's still limited. I mean, you can see that there are slight increases from the first round of NDCs to the second, but you know, again, it's it's only less than half that are really doing this. Um, 
And you know, the these limited details on costing really have important implications for implementation, right? If you don't know how much it's going to cost, it's very difficult to implement. Next slide. A third factor that we looked at for implementation readiness was do they include details on monitoring, evaluation, and learning? Um, you know, one important component of that is including timeframes. We found that 39% of ND NDCs did that in the second round. Only 13% included targets and indicators. So a lot of NDCs do have further to go. We also found that fewer than half of them describe MEL approaches in much detail, and that was only a pretty minor increase from the emission NDCs. Next slide. So I think it's it's fair to say also that tracking of NDC implementation is, is lacking, um, as our data has just demonstrated, but also pretty disconnected from MAP implementation as far as we can tell. You know, we and other organizations have tracked the implement have tracked sort of how the content, the adaptation content of NDCs is changing. You know, we can see the changes between the first and updated versions. But there, we really didn't find any systematic way to track implementation. So going from commitments to action, um, this has to be connected with, with NAP implementation as well. You know, we should not be thinking about one organization is going to build a system over here to do this and another one to do that. These really things really need to be joined up. So, you know, I'm really happy to be presenting today with partners. Um, from NAP Global Network, from the Netherlands, um, from NDCP, because I do think that partnership is where we can make progress on this. Now, of course, those of us who work on adaptation know that tracking is more complex for adaptation than for mitigation, but it is essential to moving away from that sort of slow, fragmented, incremental status that the IPCC points to. So some of the benefits that we see of finding a way to do more real-time tracking of how NDCs are changing and how implementation is happening along with NAPS is that, you know, we would be able to better identify where implementation is and is not taking place. We'd be able to better identify particular places where countries need more support. And we'd also be able to better spotlight countries that are making rapid progress so that other countries can learn from them. Next slide. So just to say a few words on the state of NAP tracking. Um, I checked this morning, 40 countries' national adaptation plans are posted on the UNFCCC's NAP Central website. UNFCCC does track progress on them on this website and also their global progress dashboard. The NAP Global Net Network showcases key information on its NAP Trends site, and I think uh, we'll hear more about that today. It is really important not to duplicate these efforts, and I just want to say that we're, we're fully aware that they're happening, and we would like to hear from other organizations what they're doing, you know, so that we can approach this as partnership. Um, I think, again, that is the real key to making progress here. So we did some experimenting with that framework that I analyzed, that I described earlier for analyzing NDCs to see how well it fit with national adaptation plans. Found that it is a pretty good fit. Um, you know, we don't have real robust findings to share because coding those maps because they're more detailed takes quite a lot of effort. And, you know, it's, but it is pretty good alignment. Um, we also found that when we looked at adaptation communications in sort of these small test runs we did, the framework works well for them as well. Next slide. So just to say a few words on adaptation communications, what are they? Um, I borrowed this definition from NAPGM's website, so thank you guys. Um, they are periodic reports prepared by countries that synthesize and share their priorities, efforts, needs, and lessons around adapting to climate change. Um, countries were encouraged to submit these ahead of the 2023 global stock take, which will culminate COP26. And you know, countries can use ADCOMs for sort of progress reports on both NDCs and NAPs in between formal updates to them. Next slide. So one thing that we're thinking about doing, kind of exploring, and it would be great to hear some feedback on these next few slides that I'm going to walk through with you, is actually using WRI's existing Climate Watch platform, at, you know, changing it from what it currently is to actually being a system for tracking implementation. We've already added all of the NDC analysis data set that I described 
on cl to Climate Watch. You can find that data there, climatewatchdata.org, um, in, in great detail, it's all those 7,000 different um, NDC actions, they're all there. You know, we have done enough analysis to, to think that we can add um, NAP and, add and adaptation communication analyses as well. Next slide. Um, so we're thinking, you know, what would a voluntary online implementation tracking system look like? You know, could we produce something that enables tra tracking the implementation status of individual adaptation actions in NDCs and their alignment with NAPs? Would that enable us to compare implementation efforts with both NDC and NAP targets and indicators? And, you know, could we show information on the financial status of actions compared to the stated costs as well? Next slide. Um, just to point out a few nice features that uh, the adapt or the Climate Watch website already has, it does enable us to kind of visualize NDC adaptation content. Next slide. It also has filters for regional and country analysis to get more refined analysis. Next slide. Thanks. Um, it does have specific country pages that offer this detail and analysis, and we have been adding information on adaptation communications as they become available. Next slide. And we think that that sort of sectoral view that I talked about at the beginning, you know, would it be possible to kind of use that as a way for countries to help us understand which areas they are most quickly implementing adaptation actions and which ones might be lagging behind. Next slide. So that brings me to the end of my presentation, but I'd like to you know, leave you with a few questions. I mean, this is a, the beginning of an idea and I, I thought it would be interesting to kind of share it you know, with a, with a friendly group um, and get some feedback on this idea. But we would also love to hear more about how your country or organization is currently thinking about alignment and also tracking or planning to track adaptation NDCs, as well as NAPs and ADCOMs, ADCOMs. And, you know, I think really critical is what would make a tool like this useful to countries? I mean, is it being able to see what peer countries are doing and compare progress? Is it being able to see trends through time? What level of detail would be most helpful? And is it things like visual snapshots or deep dives with lots of detail? And also, you know, which adaptation goals to track? And I should have added to this kind of like, what would partnership between different organizations that are already tracking these different components look like? Um, so the countries are not hunting to different locations to be able to do this. You know, how could we bring this together into a more unified whole and kind of move beyond that, that fragmentation that the IPCC talks about? And with that, I would be happy to hand back to Jamie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Really, really interesting presentation. I, I think these are some useful and deep questions for folks to consider before we move into the discussion section. If some of our participants want to think on this for a little bit and then get back to you, how should they best get in touch with you? Uh, thank you, great question. Let me put my email address in the chat. Wonderful, thanks Rebecca. Um, but yeah, I think that that was a really, really interesting overview. Very glad to see that our analyses are aligned. Um, and interesting to see too the framework for analysis for NDCs being transferable to NAPs as well. And I'm excited and interested to see more of that coming coming forward as we move into the next round of NDC updates as well. Uh, in our next session, we'll go over some of these questions and um, a few others, but I'd like to welcome uh, Orville Gray, the head of Secretariat for the NAP Global Network uh, through the International Institute for Sustainable Development, and Gerson van der Elst, the Senior Policy Advisor for International Biodiversity at the Ministry of Agriculture and Nature and Food Quality in the Netherlands. I'm very excited to have you both here. Um, if we can have you come on camera and, and join us, Gerson, I can see you well. Thank you so much. Orville, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, thank, thank you, Jimmy. Can can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jimmy, and um, thanks to the rest of the team, um, to Blair and other colleagues on call. Um, it's a pleasure being here. Um, it very very interesting um, 
information that has been shared so far, and we are we're happy to see the amount of work that has gone into it. From the NAPGN um, perspective, you know, there are two things that I'd like to mention. Uh, one looking at the NDC NAP linkages and another looking at leveraging NAP process for NDCs and ADCOMs. And in terms of the NDC NAP linkages, um, there are a few things that I'd, I'd like to highlight. NDCs and NAP processes can be mutually beneficial for both processes, um, contributing coherence, efficiency, and effectiveness to adaptation planning. Um, some of this has already been highlighted from the, the two presentations. For countries and partners, um, you know, for, for and partners providing adaptation support, we, you know, we need to be able to look on how we can build on the progress that, that has already been made and on national adaptation planning on the different processes to enhance coordination and avoid duplication. Um, as, as many people know, the, the NDCs are, for want of a better word, the big fish. Um, everyone has signed on uh, um, to that one, but we are still a ways behind with respect to the number of NAPs that have been produced. I think we're now up to 45. Um, but there, you know, we also have to consider that though it depends on a country's unique circumstances, NDCs from our perspective can be the what and NAPs can be the how. You know, NDC adaptation, the components can set out the high level vision, objectives, and the needs a country hopes to address through its adaptation efforts. And NAP processes can be a country driven operational vehicle that integrates adaptation into planning processes and implement adaptation priorities set out in the NDCs. So from that perspective, the alignment between NDCs and NAPs is definitely important. In terms of leveraging NAP processes for NDCs and ADCOMs, in preparing the ADCOM and the NDC adaptation component, countries should leverage the outputs and results of the NAP process. The NAP, from NAPGN's um, perspective and our experience supporting 22 countries prepare their first ADCOM, it shows that you know, this can be equally true whether a country is in the early stages of the NAP process or several years into implement, implementing its current NAP. If countries choose to include an adaptation chapter in their next enhanced or updated NDCs, they can look to the ADCOM elements and guidance, as well as how peer countries have approached their ADCOMs. And I think this is you know, something that we're hoping that they will look at um, quite closely. And just to share a few um, fun facts, there are 100 and um, 139 of 154 developing countries have NAP processes on the way, despite the fact that only 45 have been submitted to the UNFCCC portal. 39 developing countries have submitted an ADCOM. 18 countries have used their NDCs as the vehicle for their ADCOM, ADCOM 17 of these being developing countries. So there's quite a bit happening in the space, and um, you know we're looking forward to seeing how we can work with our partners here in terms of ensuring that this NDC NAP linkage is effective and works for all countries that we're supporting. Um, I'd, I'll pause there and, and hand it over back to you, Jimmy. Thank you, Orville. I think that's, I, I really like what you said about the NDC being the what and the NAP as the how. And I think that that's a really important takeaway as we move forward in this discussion and in our work generally, I think, we're seeing more mention and integration of the NAPs into NDCs. And as we go into the next round of NDC updates, it's something for countries to consider and how they're utilizing the, the NAP. And also very exciting to hear how many countries have their national allocation plans in the pipeline, even if they're not yet submitted. So a lot to look forward to there. And thank you very much for, for your comments here. It's always enlightening. So thank you. Thanks, Jim. Gerson, I'd like to turn to you. What are your reactions and reflections to some of this analysis? How does it resonate with what you're seeing in your work? And, and what do you think we should be taking forward as we're further engaging in some of the adaptation implementation work? Thank you very much and good afternoon or good morning, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you also for the presentations, uh, Orville, uh, Jamie, and Rebecca. They were very interesting, uh, interesting points there. Um, I agree, of course, very much on the importance of, uh, of the alignment of, uh, of NAPS and NDCs. 
and also think um, like Orville mentioned that the two processes could really strengthen each other and uh, in particular the, the NAP process which is much more in-depth could also really strengthen uh, adaptation within the NDCs while on the other hand uh, the NDC process has a higher political profile perhaps and could therefore also help uh, elevate uh, the the NEP uh, the NEPs so that would be important um, and as was mentioned already of course not all countries have NEPs yet so I think it's also important to continue to provide capacity building uh, to watch countries that don't have NEPs yet and I'm also speaking in my role as a member of the least developed countries expert group, the, the LAC, so it's particularly important to support LDCs also in developing those, those NAPs in my view. Um, and I think one way of, one key takeaway also in the Netherlands, but also in general, I would say of strengthening alignment between the NAPs and, and NDCs, in my view, would be uh, using a whole of government, all of society approach, because it doesn't really make sense to do the, these consultations uh, in silos, uh, although often the, the NDCs or, or the NEPs are, are, are still produced within a very small circle or, uh, in silos. But I really believe that that's also the example that, that we've seen in the Netherlands with our national uh, national adaptation strategies that, 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 that once you involve all of government and whole society, that it really leads to a better pr product, but also leads to much better alignment, of course. And finally, I would like to bring another process on um, on the table. That's, um, of course, the National strategy, Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plans, the MBSEPs. And I think that's also a critical component to also consider when you're talking about alignment. So not only between NDCs and MAPs, but also particularly given the low biodiversity framework that was agreed just last year and all countries are in the process of updating their their, their MBSEPs currently. I think it's also good to look at ways for, for alignment there and also work with the MBSEP accelerator uh, partnership that's, that's exploring ways in that regard. I will leave it there and come back later on. Thank you. Thank you, Grissom. I think that some of the points that you made are really and I think something that, that caught my attention was the fact that the NDC process has a higher political profile and can be a tool for raising support for adaptation components and looking at the whole of society approach is really important here. Something that I would like to raise that we saw um, as a question from one of our participants is looking at the sectoral approach. So looking at uh, national adaptation plans focusing on tourism, health, agriculture, and the overall preparation of the national adaptation plan. Rebecca, I see that you answered that question in a written form, but I'd love to get your perspective here and then come to you, Gersom, given that this is a, I think, a, a building off of the comment you made on the whole of society um, approach. So Rebecca, would you like to come in here and, and touch on this sectoral component? Sure, I'd be glad to. Yeah, I think it's absolutely critical that we do focus in on sectors because, you know, they are where a lot of the implementation has to happen, right? Both the actions on the ground, but also kind of the authority and the budgeting to, to enable them to happen. So, you know, we talked in our analysis, we looked at both the sectoral perspective, but then also kind of some overarching issues. And I, I really think that it takes both um, when we're thinking about how how we're going to track implementation of both NDCs and NAPs. Great. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Gerson, any reactions from your end? I know you emphasized already the importance of the whole of society approach, but do you see taking sectoral approaches having a particular effect in, in any of the work that you've been doing? Any thoughts on this question? Uh, perhaps I could speak to some of the work we have been doing on uh, related to water. Uh, as the Netherlands, we have been a very active uh, proponent, proponent of adaptation ex action worldwide. I think for a long time already, we have been involved in the Global Adaptation Center, um, the Global Adaptation Summit, uh, etc. So, uh, and we are also committed to provide more than half of our uh, adaptation or climate finance to, to adaptation efforts, for instance. But what we also come to realize is that water is actually very critical component in 
achieving the SDGs and in achieving climate adaptation and mitigation. Um, our ambassador for sustainable development likes to say that for climate action, there are actually two molecules that are very important, and that's CO2, and the other one is H2O, water, of course. So in that spirit, we also organized the UN Water Conference, co-hosted the UN Water Conference earlier this year. And uh, part of that are several very relevant outcomes. I think one of those is the, global, uh, is the work of the Global Commission on the Economics of Water. And one of their findings is really that without increasing our efforts on water, we will not be able to, to reach our mitigation, also adaptation ambition. So, and also that water is actually uh, a tool for alignment and could serve as an organizing principle also across sectors actually to, to advance uh, climate action. And um, to talk a bit more on our experience in that regard, we've, uh, as part of the outcomes of the Young Water Conference, there's also a, a water action agenda. And I checked today, there are more than 800 uh, commitments registered already. And one of those commitments also from the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, together with the NDC partnership to work more closely in uh, uh, actually implementing some of the requests uh, that that arrive from countries related to water in their NDCs. So we have seen that actually more requests are being submitted, but that there is still relatively low response to those uh, requests. And that's why we also committed to provide additional funding to uh, specifically to water related requests to also help advance uh, alignment in that sense. So I think I will leave it at there. Thank you, Kirsten. I was just thinking as you were, were talking that the trends that we see in requests for water are certainly higher in, in adaptation and looking at oceans and coasts, so very relevant there. Um, I think when looking at sectors, an example that comes to mind from the work under the Climate Action Enhancement Package um, is the, the sectoral basis um, or the, the identification of implementation barriers on a sectoral basis that Namibia carried out. Um, and in a second, I'd like to come to you, Orville, to, to touch on some of the financial barriers and challenges that countries are facing in their uh, in the adaptation components of their NDCs and how they're identifying those and how to overcome them and, and what some of the takeaways that uh, NAP GN has. I know with your recently published report, there's a lot in terms of aligning NDCs and NAPs. And I'd love to hear if we can make the connection to, to how countries can mobilize um, some of the resources there is that's one of the predominant challenges that we we have but in looking at the Namibia example we saw that they they took a look at, at barriers to implementation including the institutional technological organizational and financial barriers to uh, allow the government to highlight resource mobilization needs for implementing the, the NDC. And so some of the support through that came in terms of financial and technical support to close information gaps um, around low carbon technology investments. And I'm curious um, to hear your thoughts on what, what kind of support countries can request to better mobilize some of the finances, if there's preparatory support that you see as being most effective or necessary in this realm. That Th thanks, Jimmy. Um, you know, th th this is this is a very in in interesting um, question. Um, as as NAPGN, you know, our, our focus is primarily around the NAP processes and providing support there. And in terms of the request that we get, especially on on, on technical capacity, um, you know, we've been able to help countries to, um, in some cases, you know, close the gap between having a, a NAP process and documentation on the way and, and having it finalized to being submitted. Um, we have also been doing a bit of work in trying to um, align the NAP process with the NDCs. And, and with that, of course, comes the question about the not just the capacity support that's required from a, a technical perspective, but also in terms of aligning the commitments that have been made under the NDC where adaptation is concerned and what does that look like in terms of the implementation process so you know we've gone in and provided support in for instance um, ensuring that um, gender considerations are included um, not just in in the NAPS but also in the NDC to, to ensure that that adaptation link is complete 
um, we have we have looked at um, you know how to, for instance, bring relevant stakeholders in 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 in, in sessions that are dealing with um, immediate priorities pertaining to adaptation and provide support there in terms of strengthening the existing policy structure that may be in country or, or looking at, for instance, the mail systems in countries. We have been doing quite a bit of work there and that has helped us to identify priority needs and be able to provide even costing um, for some countries to, to get them to understand and, and be able to address some of those gaps that they've been seeing. Um, many of the countries that we're supporting also have received support from the GCF. So in terms of their NAP readiness, um, you know, we have been coming in and providing technical support um, through partnerships with, with other um, partners to be able to address some of these um, components, looking at things like, for instance, NDC enhancement um, and, and looking into the, the male components of those. So I think overall we've been trying to you know, bridge that gap with the small financing that we have. Um, we've been, we're now up to about 65 countries in terms of our reach, and we're looking to see how we can um, continue to support other countries. Um, we do have, of course, some um, constraints in terms of um, capacity to do, but we we have not been saying no to anyone. Um, our doors are still open, and we're looking to see how we can um, continue some of these partnerships. Um, some of the unsupported areas that you have flagged in your presentation in terms of other NDC partnerships, we have been taking a look at some of those as well to see whether or not we are in a position to provide technical support um, you know, from the funding that we have to address some of those gaps that have been identified, and in that way, be able to ensure that there's greater alignment between the NDC processes in countries as well as the, the NAP processes. So, um, you know, happy to speak further to that if necessary. Thank you so much. And I know that we have in the, the coming months an insight brief that we've been working with IISD on in terms of looking at adaptation requests and some of the insights there, the best practices and some country examples. So we'll also encourage our audience to keep an eye out for, for those in the coming in the coming months. We'll have a blog and an insight brief published on those. Um, thank you so much, Orville. That's really helpful. Uh, Rebecca, we do have a question in the chat that I, I think could be a useful wrap up and, and close to our question and answer session that just is on some of the, the basics and making sure that we're really clear in terms of the, the main differences between the national adaptation plans and adaptation communications, how countries can make sure that they are identifying correct priorities between these and, and how um, and where people can access resources on these, which we'll send in our follow-up email to those who register. But wondering if you can just touch on some of the, if countries are looking to develop this work further, where should they look? What can they do? Where should they go? Yeah, um, so I have to say that I am not a great expert on what the UNFCCC, you know, like exactly where things are on their site. Um, it's my understanding and happy to have either of our two other panelists chime in if, if their understanding is different, but you know I think the adaptation communications are meant to be quite flexible right. So I see the comment in the chat that says you know Nepal has submitted its snap summary for policymakers as adcon. When we looked at the ones that we found available, there was a wide variation. So I think they're quite a flexible mechanism for countries, you know, to register. Um, something official that doesn't necessarily have to fit within like the quite specific boxes of NDCs and NAPs. Um, I am not sure about the question about the enhanced transparency framework. Uh, maybe one of the other uh, panelists is, and then I can share a, I think I can find a link to the NAP tracking dashboard. Um, although I, I am having a problem in that I can't seem to chat to everyone. Somehow I was trying to put my email address in there and it, I just don't see an everyone option. Um, but will, we can certainly see if we can find that info. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm more than happy to circulate resources to the folks who have registered after the session. As I mentioned, we'll share the, the slides as well as the link to the recording. Um, but thank you so much, Rebecca. I appreciate that. Um, Orville, Gersom, uh, as we are coming to the end of the session, any closing thoughts, reactions, any burning ideas that you think our audience should hear from you before we close? Thanks, Jimmy. Um, you know, from our end, you know, one of the things that we were in, we were happy to hear coming out of the SBs is, is that, um, you know, countries are still pursuing 
there are now processes and um, from the from all levels everyone is still sees this as a very important process that needs to um, gain momentum um, we know that there are 45 um, naps that have been submitted but we know that from the gcf there are a number of processes that are well underway and we are projecting that many of those will come on stream um, the, if not this year next year so we are anticipating a, a big increase um, in the number of NAPs submitted. We know that just last year alone, we um, to, to know there have been almost a 30% increase in the number of NAPs submitted. So um, it remains an area of importance, but you know we, we do recognize that there's a spectrum here in respect of um, NAP and NAP processes. Um, and you know we have some that are still in the process of developing a NAP and others that have developed a NAP or you know looking to update a NAP. So there's quite a bit taking place there, and um, the implementation is going to be different, not just because of country circumstances, but also in terms of where they are in the process itself. And aligning these processes with the NDCs is going to be very interesting. Um, there are a lot of um, different reporting frameworks out there. There's the ADCOMS, we have the, the BTR adaptation um, component coming out soon. So there, there's a lot that is taking place that we will need to align. Um, you have the SDGs that we still talk about as well. So, you know, the, the question is, how do we, you know, ensure that the, the big targets that are identified, um, we are in a process to help countries to address those gaps on the implementation side where it's it's very critical and where we're, we're going to be able to really speak about monitoring um, and learning in, in a very significant way. Thanks, Rahul. Very exciting as we, you know, in the climate action world are never without work to do. So glad to hear that all of those things are going to be coming, coming in the coming years. Um, Gertham, do you have any closing thoughts, any reactions? Thank you. I think there is not much, much more to, to say on my behalf, but I would just like to, to thank everyone uh, for this very interesting and inspiring conversation. And uh, I look forward to continue to work with you and also to connect you uh, to some of the work that we're doing as the Netherlands, uh, perhaps share some, some of our lessons learned and uh, happy also to take on some of the ideas that, that you might have uh, in the different uh, fora where, where I am active or where my colleagues may be active to pursue the alignment of NDCs and, uh, and NAPs. Uh, I think we, yeah, we re remain very committed to, to support that process. Um, so I think I'll leave that there. Fantastic, thank you so much. Yeah, the support of the Netherlands has been very important in adaptation. So we're very pleased to continue that work with you. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up today's session and just express my thanks to everyone for attending. We hope that you can join us for our upcoming webinars. On the 11th of July, we'll be having a session on food loss and waste reduction in NDCs. And you can register for that session um, via the link on the screen. And then on the 20th of July, we'll be holding a session on blue carbon. And you can register uh, again via the link on the screen. I wanna say a huge thank you to all of our panelists and discussants today. Thank you, Rebecca, Orville, and Gerson. This was a really fascinating conversation. And I think a lot of takeaways in terms of where we stand with national adaptation plans, where we're seeing them in NDCs, the implementation work that's to come, as well as more NAPs in the pipeline and, and more of the sectoral work and mobilizing of, of resources to come. Huge thank you to all of our participants and attendees today. We do want to hear from you. We'll be following up with email uh, by email with resources from the session, the PowerPoint reports mentioned, as well as some of the discussion questions that Rebecca shared so that you can share your thoughts in the coming weeks if something comes to you after having some time to think or discuss with colleagues. But we hope to see you at our next and upcoming sessions. And thank you very much to everyone for attending today. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.